because I kept trying to do the math of like, if I just do spots in New York, if I get to do spots and do this job, if, I, and I was still, the rent was like not, it just wasn't adding up to the rent. And I was like, oof, okay. So I think the thing I got to do is write a hit book. I'm Sharla Lariston, a stand-up comedian, writer, director, and producer, and this is The Working Writer Podcast, where screenwriters, creatives, and industry insiders share their stories of breaking in in hopes that it helps you along your path. I'm so excited you could join us. If you like what you hear, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Without further ado, let's get to work. What's up? Welcome to another episode of the Working Writer Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. My guest today is Joe Firestone. Joe is a comedian, actor, and writer. Her credits include shows like Z-Way, Joe Para Talks With You, The Tonight Show, and Shrill. And Joe recently released her debut mystery novel, Murder on Sex Island, a Luella Van Horn mystery. It's out now. It dropped October 17th. I ordered my copy. I can't wait to read it. And I hope you consider checking out the book. I have put the link in the description, so make sure to check it out. In this episode, Joe and I talk about pivoting, being a lazy writer, and what it was like for Joe to self-publish her debut novel. I hope you enjoy it. And without any further ado, please check out this episode with Joe Firestone. Joe Firestone, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. So, Joe, I want to jump right into it. I want to ask, like, what is your cultural background? Where are you from? Who are you? Okay, I'm from St. Louis. I'm a St. Louis Jewish uh, person. And uh, I am in my late 30s. (laughs) No one has ever answered that question with their age, but I I agree that how old we are is a big part of it. Um, Are you feeling like, uh, I'm really feeling my late 30s right now. Like I'm really starting to feel it. Like I'm feeling like 40s, like right around the corner. Yeah. Yeah. And I do feel like so much older than um, most of the people in this industry. I feel it. I feel like, I don't know, like something should have happened to me, but I should have (laughs) (laughs) removed and uh, yeah, so it is funny how quickly we age out because I remember when, um, a lot because we are in the, sort of the same cohort, like we started coming up around the same time, and like mm-hmm. I just feel like when we started, it was just like we're young whippersnappers, and now very quickly, like in the blink of an eye, like I think 10 years has gone by, and it's like you're almost 40. Damn, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 I feel I feel it too. Yeah. Um, so what is that? What was your, I guess, path into uh, creativity or into the industry specifically or into stand up? Like you're from St. Louis, Missouri, and like, <laughs> which is not, you know, I actually don't know much about St. Louis, Missouri in terms of like what the creative scene is like over there, what stand up scene is like. What is it like? I think that it, it well, there's like a festival now, there, like the Flyover Festival, which is cool. But the, at the time, it was very. Bur- I think I'm using this word right, burgeoning community. Mm-hmm. Bur- You're bur- using it. Mm-hmm. Okay. You did write a book, Joe. You be- <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you'd be surprised at what words yeah. are in there. Um, mm-hmm. But I would say that it's like uh, it was. It, I would say that it was a very small community. I would say of like I could count on my hands and feet how many people were uh so like probably 20 and uh that were in this scene and um so I would say that it was it was like a small pond in a way that I don't think um I think it kind of got me to think like oh you can just do whatever you want because there's so few people and and there's like all this un uh, there's like venues and there's like people that are excited about comedy, but there wasn't that much comedy. And so I like saw that as an opportunity to kind of make things happen. And then I don't think I was getting better though. I think that in St. Louis, it because of the scene was so small, I wasn't really, 
uh, challenging myself to get better. And then I came to New York and I was like, oh no, it's so hard here. But I was still like operating from that like place of like, just do, just make your own stuff and put on your own shows and see how that goes. But I did feel like uh, I had to get so much better to be here. I totally agree. I didn't start in the scene. I'm from Boston, Mass, or I'm from Mm -hmm. Taunton, Mass, but like you just say Boston because nobody knows where Taunton is. I didn't start there, but I'm kind of glad I didn't start there because I started in New York and it was so hard, (laughs) so intimidating. Mm -hmm. I felt like it forced me to like either get good or get go away (laughs) very quickly. Like you either have to just jump in or go away because people are watching you there. There's actual opportunity there. There's real challenge there. So that's really interesting. How long did you do it in St. Louis before you decided to make the move to New York? I was just there for, uh, like I went, I went to college and then I kind of went on this tour that I devised with my friend Dylan Marin. We like went on a little tour together and obviously made no money. And then uh, he went back home and I went back home and uh, then, yeah, and then I guess from there I stayed in St. Louis for about a year to make money and save up and live with my parents and then so I could move ultimately to New York eventually. And that's, so I, I did some, I did a lot of comedy and some, a lot of kitchen work. How long was it that you did that stuff before you actually moved to New York? A year. I was just there a year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I drove to New York uh, with a long ago boyfriend and we uh, moved into a place that we didn't realize did not have a bathroom and we just (laughs) got to work. (laughs) New York is such a joke. (laughs) I know. It's it's like we all want to live there, you know, but they just really make it hard. Come on. Constant gotchas. Constant. I moved into an apartment with some friends that had like um, a door that was too small to kind of enter. So you kind of had to enter into the side, like to one of my roommate's (laughs) bedrooms. And then the actual stove was in the living room when we got there. And I was like, is somebody going to move this stove? (laughs) And they're like, yeah, we'll move the stove. But I'm just like, they have no shame. They'll just show you an apartment that looks like (laughs) shit and they don't care because they know you can't afford it and you got to live there. So wonderful. I... Mm -hmm. How did you guys survive without a bathroom? Like, what did you do? There was a bathroom down the hall. I see. So you lived in one of those. Yeah. So it was kind of like one of those single room occupancy right. kind of deals. Oh, my God. Oh, my I God. I just didn't think to look for a damn bathroom. And uh, yeah. You wouldn't think. You wouldn't think. Here you go. Yeah. So we shared the bathroom with the guy down the hall. It was very nice. strange. Yeah. Right, right, right. You know, one thing I've always thought was interesting about you, Joe, is that you, your persona on stage is very, you know, nervous and anxious. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered how much of that is real. Like how much of that is a persona that you've kind of honed and how much of that is like you're actually a nervous person or an anxious person? Uh, Unfortunately, I'm very anxious and I really did think that I was getting away with not seeming anxious on stage. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, this is where I'm chill. And that is, I guess that is not, I've, I've heard, I've heard from a few people at this point in my life that it's like, I do seem pretty on edge up there. And like, like one time I got this email from this stranger and uh, it really, really fucked me up for a long time. But he, uh, this guy, I found out he'd been in, uh, he'd been in prison and he ran for mayor. Like he was like a really, uh, you know, colorful character. Mm -hmm. He emailed me cold and was like, you are so, uh, anxious on stage. I want you to come over to my hotel room. I'll eat you out. I was like, oh. (laughs) Took such a turn. (laughs) I said, oh, uh oh, that's not my, that's not what I'm trying to put out there. Uh, so you're basically like flash, flashing, I need to be eaten out on stage. That's how nervous <laughs> I'm, I'm, that's, you are. That was not what I was intending. That's what you're telegraphing. I was trying to say, I'm chill, I'm confident, and that is obviously not what people are picking up. So that is, you know, Obviously, you said it a lot gentler than that guy did. But, you know, there's like a lot of, you know, I understand that that's kind of the perception for sure. So even though you are an actually anxious person, you feel on stage is where your chill, your calm place, your happy place is? 
I feel like uh, even if I am anxious before a set, once I'm on stage, it's like, what can you do? You can't be anxious. Well, I really, it's like you can't have the same coping mechanisms you have off stage because uh, people will start to, you know, uh, be concerned. And so it's like, I, I really uh, do try to be um, relaxed on stage. Now, I do think with the rise of uh, comedy photography, I have seen that that is not exactly what um, the posture nor the facial expressions that I do think I'm giving <laughs> are, are what's happening. However, it's, it's worth a try. What brought you into comedy, I guess, into performing as an anxious person? I guess, you know, watching comedy did make me feel better when I was uh, not doing comedy. I really liked the effect comedy had. And uh, I think that um, I always liked to make like little plays and videos with my friends in school. And uh, I think it... Uh, I did like I just I stopped going to college for a little bit and then uh I was like, you know, what do I really want to do here? Um and then I thought, you know, I really do want to m- make comedy. And so that was kind of it kind of it was nice to think about that because I I went to a school that was a little bit above my um brain level. I like I realized that I really didn't know how to like read or write very well until I went to college and then was kind of a little bit of a fish out of water. And so that was, it was kind of like, well, figure out what you want to do here. Cause this is, you know, otherwise it's going to be too overwhelming. That's really smart. That's a really wise decision to make. Mm-hmm. I want to know so much more, Joe. So like, first of all, where did you go to college and what did you go for? I went to Wesleyan university in Connecticut. Really good school. It's a good school. Uh, I went to, uh, I, I went, I thought I wanted to like study. I, I didn't really know what I wanted to go for. I think I thought, uh, I'd go for maybe like theater or something. I really love theater. I love musical theater. I love plays. I can't, um, I realized that, you know, I, I will say that there, you know, I'd say, especially in this kind of modern generation of comedy, there's a lot of, um, eagerness to embrace a multi-hyphenate lifestyle. And yes. I have learned that I am not, I'm not a multi-hyphenate. I am not supposed to be <laughs> acting <laughs> at all. And it's like, that is not what I, that is not what I was meant to do. I love it. I love a good actor. I love a good performance. I love a good singing, dancing. I, I just think they're magical traits and beautiful to, to watch and it transforms me. And, and yet this is the same thing happened with improv where I was like, I think improv is so amazing. And it took me five years to be like, um, Oh, I can't do that. That's not something, that, <laughs> <laughs> something that I'm supposed to do. Wait. So you went to Wesleyan for, for theater and you were just like, this is not for me. Yeah. Because they were, I mean, it was like all like, um, it, it was like, uh, intellectual theater. And I was like, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. And and it was like, and so then I ended up kind of studying um, like history and literature. But it was like, I it's still, I was just like, I don't, someone help me. I don't understand. Yeah. And so there was a lot of, I don't understand. So what was that process like? Because that I imagine might have been a big decision to leave. So you didn't, you ended up not finishing at Wesleyan? I left right after my freshman year and then I came back. And you finished? I finished. I worked out yeah. I went home and my parents were like, if you're gonna stay here, you gotta you gotta work. And I got a job. Um and this is when I kind of realized I maybe wanted to do comedy. I got a job at an apple orchard, um opening I'm uh, doing like performances for the children. Right, like the school groups, like mm-hmm. um and then also opening for the baby pig race. <laughs> that told you that you know what I think I want to perform well it was like I guess my first professional gig mm-hmm. yeah it was $40 a day $10 an hour four hours a day and um yeah they got the this uh, like 10 baby pigs to race with the, they put little Oreos in the front of it and made them run around a track and I was 
I was their opening act. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that the one? It is cool. But I want to know a little bit more because I feel like um, pivoting is something that is not easy, I think, for a lot of us. You know, like if you're in a school, Wesleyan is a, is a, is a good school. It's not like, you know, not a good school. <laughs> so it's a pretty good school. So I feel like, you know, having the presence of mind to be like, this is not working for me. I need to take a step back. I need to like reevaluate what I want to do. Like this is kind of a really wise kind of thing to do. And I I feel like at least for me, any kind of um, having to pivot, any kind of like having to like realize, hey, like for instance, if I was in your position, if I had chosen a major and I was just like, this is really hard, I probably would have just kind of forced myself to finish it or something. Maybe Mm. I would have changed my major, but like for the most part, like I don't think I would have had like the... I guess the balls to take a break because I would be too scared that I wouldn't finish and and then I'd be disappointing people. So I'm just kind of wondering like what was going through your head? Why were you able to like take that step back and pivot? Well, my favorite thing to do as an adult is pivot. I've pivoted several times um, within this field. I did at one point go to a school for herbology (laughs) last couple of years I have pivoted so uh, so much I was like maybe I'll be a director maybe I'll be a writer maybe I'll be an actor maybe I'll be a you know and then it's like I'll go to veterinary school I'll apply to be a therapist whatever I've pivoted so much because I keep I would say that this I I I wrote a mystery book these things are not supposed (laughs) none of this makes sense and then it's like I think the thing is is that I always um, I think this industry is really challenging. And I think if you're like at all struggling with, you know, self-esteem or any of it, there's so much feedback to let you know that you're doing it wrong. And I kept <laughs> like hoping that I'd find something that I was like, oh, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm supposed to do. Even if it was, you know, with herbs, <laughs> that's why I keep pivoting. So I actually like pivoting, but I do find that when you are pivoting, you're just on the same you know, court or whatever. You're just not, it's, I haven't learned, I've learned maybe things that I'm not supposed to do, but I haven't learned the thing I'm supposed to do, which is, you know, so it continues. I continue to turn around. I'm so fascinated by this convo because I I honestly feel the exact same way. Like, I feel like I jump from thing to thing. Really? Yeah. I've literally been thinking about going back to school for uh, psychology for a while, but I don't know if I want to go back to school because I'm like, what if I change my mind? What if I don't have like the what if I don't have a deep interest in it? Yeah. So I feel the exact same way. I've dipped my toe in things and I'm afraid that I'll never get good at one thing. That's my fear. That, yeah. What would it ideally look like for you right now if you had the kind of career that you want to? Like, what does it look like? My brain is drawing a blank, but I guess I would say that it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I think there's just like, there's this constant hope for security, right? Where you're like, okay, like this, this job is for this long. And then this job, yes. it, I think it's like, I think success just always feels like working, right? So like when you're currently working, that's when you feel, and that's not necessarily always good feelings, but I'd say yeah. that when you are actively employed, not before, not maybe when you get the first call before yeah. they, you know, start explaining a contract like right. before that that moment and then when you're actually like maybe like a Wednesday in the middle of a work <laughs> you know that's when you're like oh, okay look I'm doing it I'm secure yeah have you done anything else to make yourself secure because that's another thing that I feel like we have to do as artists in the kind of industry that we're in is that we have to create security for ourselves so I'm like wondering what are you doing to create security for yourself? Which I think your book is a big one. You know, that's a huge thing that you're doing to create security for yourself. But is there, what else are you doing? I've been doing this thing where I make a lot of tea. Um, (laughs) I've been trying to do this thing where I don't, um, like I've realized that certain things make me feel really bad. So I am like, okay, these are the things you got to avoid if you want to feel good and secure. Um, Yeah, I was, I think that it's like the goal is peace. Absolutely. You know, and so it's like if looking at 
you know, numbers of how many people, you know, downloaded something or watched something, if that really makes me feel horrible. So, okay. Because no matter what the number is, I'm like, oh, it's too. It's not enough. It's <laughs> not enough, or it's not this. These people don't even like it, or yeah. There's no happy ending with numbers because numbers are just like data that have no. There's no analysis. Yeah. So I've realized if I can avoid numbers, that's really good. Okay. And uh, I really like reading and kind of spending time. Uh, off of screens that that does make me feel a little bit more secure that helps a lot yeah yeah all right let's take a break and when we come back i want to ask you about your new book so joe yeah you wrote a book yeah i want to know like how you came up with the idea for the book um and like basically what made you decide to write it? Because as far as I can tell, it, it was self-published. Yes. Yeah. You, you could tell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, could, you, could you said tell. that you said it on your social media. It's self-published. Mm-hmm. So that means that there was no like money. There was no money, nope. <laughs> no publisher waiting for your draft, no editor, no editor. Like you basically did this completely by yourself. First of all, why? Yeah. <laughs> and second of all, <laughs> what was that process like for you? Well, to be fair, I did enlist uh, some friends to read it and proofread it. So that was really helpful. But again, they were um, their friends. And so they can't really, you know, they're not being paid to do this. So they did as much as they could. But I, I would say that in general, I did write. So I had not got worked in a while. And this was like even before the strike started. And I was like, you know what? I think because I kept trying to do the math of like, if I just do spots in New York, if I get to do spots and do this job, if I, and I was still the rent was like not. It just wasn't adding up to the rent. And I was like, Oof, OK, so I think the thing I got to do is write a hit book. <laughs> right. And so then I thought that I'll do that. And then. I was like, wrote this book and I was like, really, I thought I really had a lot of confidence in it that it would be a hit. And then, um, cause I love murder mysteries and I love like the formula of them. And I took, I took a class and the class was really helpful. And I got, I like actually committed to a schedule somehow that, and then I started shopping it around and everyone was like, no, no. <laughs> And I was like, what? Are really? There's no one? And no one. Literally no one. I had so so many rejections. And then I thought, okay, well, I guess I'll venture into self-publishing because I'd written this whole thing. And I was like, well, I guess it's – so then I, like, had to figure out um, – I just thought, you know, maybe if I can just break even with it, then I'll call it a success. And it's like – it's – uh. I would say that it's like there are certain things that I think like uh, reading it now I'm like well, okay well there there's like maybe 3 to 4 plot holes and I'd say seven typos <laughs> that if someone were adventurous they could find and also the title when you google it uh Jeffrey Epstein um pops up and that's tough um but besides that I would say that in general I think I'm feel, I feel good about it but it is like I just uh you know, I think that it's um, I, th- that thing of like work smarter, not harder. I think I do the other one. Work harder, <laughs> not smarter. <laughs> Why would you say that? Well, I think that you should probably should sell a book if you're going to write it. It would be ideal to do that. Um, however, you know, that's not a friend. The cards for everyone. And, you know, that's, you know, I'm. I spend a lot of time on the Reddit self-publishing um, forums and, you know, it's a, I'd say it's a community of straight talkers for sure. You know, <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people are really disappointed that they have to self-publish, but I guess at the same time, I'm glad that, uh, I guess, you know, I think it's like in, in some sense of the word, it's, it's pure, you know, I, nobody else has told me that this has to happen slower. This has, you know, it's been like, Apart from those, like, three friends, it's like, uh, I just, you know, I did what I thought I should do. And hopefully it turns out it's, like, something people want to read. 
And if not, then it'll just go away because nobody even knows any self-publishing books. (laughs) (laughs) What did you learn from self-publishing? Well, you have to, uh, you get to make a lot of decisions. So that's kind of nice. You get to like decide what your cover looks like. And, you know, you get to, um, I think the big thing is you get to, I think there's a big difference between seeing something in a Word doc and seeing something in a book. And that is not always the best transition because certain things that should be in a Word doc and certain things shouldn't be in a book. You know what I mean? Like major typos, et cetera. However, I do think that it's, um, I think in the publishing industry, from what I can gather, much like show business, is a very difficult industry to break into and uh, really difficult to navigate. And I think that the friends I know that have written books have said it's very challenging that have gotten paid to write them and they got paid to write them. So I don't know if it's for anybody, but yeah, I think that I don't have you, have you thought about writing a book? I really want to, I have started writing notes for one and I don't know if I'll ever finish it. (laughs) I don't know. Like I've really struggled to like stay on a schedule and stay motivated because it's a whole book and because it just takes more. Um, it just takes, it's just a really long time on one thing. And so, yeah, I've struggled. I, I try not to talk about it too specifically because I don't want anyone like thinking I'm going to like come out with a book. <laughs> I just, uh, yeah, I get it. I just would like to, but I think that I yeah. gotta, I gotta plug. I gotta plug. I think you gotta take a class. I haven't taken a book writing class, but what what class do you recommend? I went, did a class. I never showed up. There was no Zoom. It was not in person. It was online. No Zoom. Wait. I never saw anybody's face. You never saw anybody, and you still did it. You still showed up and did it. It was take it when you want. Mm -hmm. on your own schedule, but you had to submit pieces every week. What was this class? Where where was it? It was a Gotham Writers Workshop. It was a mystery writing class. But it's like, the thing is, is there was was just a little bit of pressure in putting your work out there for peer review, where people were going to read it. And even if they didn't know who you were and you didn't know who they were, there was a little bit of pressure to try to make it something readable. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Because you're getting feedback on it. And, you know, in our profession, I'd say feedback is, uh, you know, that's what we're going on. Right. So like that was enough to get me kind of going. And then once you get feedback, then there's more to adjust. And it's like at least you by the end of the class, you have at least 25 pages, which is like so much further. And then by 25, you're like oh, I wish I could get to 30. And it's like, then you have a 30 page doc and you're like, I'm amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, well, if it, how many words is this? And then you see it's like 70, uh, what, seven, I don't know what, if, maybe it's 10,000 words. And you're like, well, okay, how much is a book? You Google this book is 60 to 80,000 words, oh, right? Oh, snap. I thought it was 40,000. Oh my well, God. I think a certain, I think a nonfiction memoir could be 40,000. Oh, okay. okay. I think a novel's like 60. Oh my God. I had heard it was 50,000. A novel was 50,000. And then everybody was like, no, you're stupid. <laughs> I said, okay. But so then I was like, 50,000. So that's just ten, five times what I have right now. Yeah. I think that the biggest thing was having an outline, not a good outline, just mm-hmm. chapter three. She mm-hmm. comes home, uh, finds, <laughs> you know, <laughs> chapter four, she sees a man. Chapter five, she, and it was like one sentence, but that was enough for me to be like, I can't look at the blank screen because I know what's supposed to happen. Mm-hmm. And those were the two big things is just being like, oh, it's just, okay, they'll just, I just got to get to page 30. Oh, I guess I just got to get to page 32. Now I've got 32 pages. Wouldn't it feel good to have 40? Right. How long would you say this whole process took you? Mm, I start, okay, so I had big dreams. The big dream started in, um, I would say the big dream started in January and it's coming out in October. Wow. You started it in January? Self-publishing is so fast. It's all, I'd say too fast. Wait, you started writing it in January? Like you took the class in January and started writing it and then by October it was, you're ready to self-publish. Yes. 
That's really fast. You can go really fast. Yeah. I, I always think about this. R.L. Stein writes something like, I think he writes 2,000 words a day. Mm-hmm. He can write a Goosebumps in 12 days. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. But it's like, we're not all going to be R.L. Stein, but it is yeah. like, I also was like trying to figure out when I was best at, at writing, like what time of day. When was that? It was after my first cup of coffee in the morning. Okay. After the okay. second cup, it really did go downhill. So I had about okay. two hours in the morning. Okay. I do think showing, not even like, oh, just have a friend to be accountable. Having a regular showing is big. But you didn't have that class the entire time that you were writing the book, did you? You probably only had it for like a few weeks and then you basically had to do it, get on your own schedule. The class was for 10 weeks and then I had, uh, yeah, and then I was motivated by fame and fortune. Right. And then <laughs> and then once I realized fame and fortune was not in the cards, I did slow down quite a bit, have a lot of meltdowns. Um and then I kind of did a revamp of it, and it kind of slowed after that. But it got it there. was it eventually got. I mean, there. I think it's a huge accomplishment. I think writing a book, whether it's self published or not, is a huge accomplishment. I hope you feel that and know that. Yeah, it's uh, it is it's a, it's something to, it's something I've done for sure. I would say that it's uh, something that you know it's not you know it's not. I wouldn't call it literature. <laughs> I was trying to go for like a, you know, scary, sexy book. And um, I would say it's not scary enough to be scared. I would say that it's like, and there's no penetration. I don't know. I'd say that it's not. <laughs> don't give it away. Okay. Sorry. There's penetration. I, um, <laughs> I think that also kind of helped me is that like, I also was going to go by a pen name because I was like, oh, this is trash. I could just make trash. And that kind of freed me up from that perfectionism you're talking about, where it's like, mm-hmm. oh, this is just supposed to be a mystery. It's not supposed to be fine literature. I'm just supposed to make things in, in t- titillating. And so I was going to go by this pen name, J.J. Loaf. But then um, I just <laughs> – and then my boyfriend was like, literally no one will buy it. You want to you need to, <laughs> you want to sell at least three copies, you got to go by your name. So what was the plan to promote the book? Because now since you've self-published, now you also have to like promote it by yourself and like do all that stuff by yourself. Like what has been yeah. the the strategy? Thank you so much for having me on this podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd say, um, so I was like, okay, I know what I'll, I, I was like this uh, woman I know, Barry Finkel, she was like, do you want to do an audio book version? And I was like, maybe, yeah. So we were like releasing it as a podcast. Amazing. So that's being released for free. So, you know, ideally somebody is so excited about the podcast that they buy the book. However, I do think that they'll just finish the podcast <laughs> and then not buy the book. <laughs> and so there is something there is something there that I think it was maybe a missed opportunity for commerce. However, you know, however it gets the story out is what I'm trying to, yeah. So that's the, that's the strategy, just doing podcasts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing it, putting, it, putting out it out there. there. I try to think about how I would find out about a book. Yeah. Because I read a lot of trash and uh, usually the trash, I never want to pick up trash on my own because I don't want to be, I don't want to be tricked. You know, I don't want to experience bad trash. I want to yeah. experience good trash. So it's very important to me that I get the trash recommended. So I don't know how you get st- people to recommend your work to their friends, but however that is, that's the secret. That's the secret. <laughs> Do you think you'll ever write another book now that you've had this experience? I was trying to write another one, but I think that right now I like keep thinking about self-publishing again, which does sound really, really bad and expensive. And um, I think that if I were to do it again, it'd be awesome if somebody would help publish it. But um, I guess also... um, Maybe I do want to figure out a way to maybe write them faster and be able to just kind of maybe get that. A lot of the self-publishing people on Reddit are like, you have to create a series. That's big. Oh, wow. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm like, a series, but we already did one. But they're like, you need a series. <laughs> and so that would, I guess, would help with ideally. But I think it's like, uh, uh, yeah, I think sometimes I go in and out of like liking stand up and going out at night, leaving the house at night. Yeah, I struggle with that as well. Yeah, yeah this was like this beacon of like hope, like, you don't have to go out at night if you don't have a book. <laughs> You can just be like Judy Bloom living in Key West, you know, and that was not yeah. necessarily what happened. However, I do think, you know, um, there are a lot of hopeful tales on Reddit of people, you know, self-publishing success stories. Of course, yeah. those are rare. And I've purchased a lot of self-published books since starting. And they are, um, on the whole, I'd say uh, tough. Interesting. Tough. Yeah. But they are also truthful to the writing of the author. Right. <laughs> so you said self-publishing was expensive? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What do you yeah. pay for? Well, I guess if you could do graphic design, yeah, you'd be golden. Right. However, that's really not my strong suit. So you had to pay for someone to design the interior, and you have to mm-hmm. pay for someone to design the book cover. And you have to pay for the ISBN. Yes. ISBN. Yeah, that number. And you have to pay for it to be distributed to booksellers. Mm-hmm. How did you choose to distribute it? What what platform are you using? I guess I have on um, occasion said bad things about the self-publishing process. And I don't want them to come for me. So okay. I'm just going to say... That it was one that was moderately priced. And okay. I'd say that over the whole, I'd say this was a, a, a good service. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much you believe it. You didn't even say the actual name of the place and you couldn't even fully <laughs> say that it was a good service. <laughs> I do think that there is a benefit to this, though. I think, so the thing that I think is great about publishing books, whether it's self-published or not, is that like one of the biggest issues that I have in TV is that when you sell a TV show, you don't fully own the show. Oh. You essentially become an employee of whatever studio or network buys the show. Um, and maybe, you know, as a showrunner, you'll get some points on the show. So like you, you, part- you have some profit participation when it comes to like how well the show does and things like that. But yeah. If you have a book, if you have source material, if you have, you know, if you have something that whatever TV show you're selling is based off of, you essentially you own that IP. Owning a book is the way that you writing a book is the way that you own your IP or one of the ways that you own your IP. And also a podcast, like the podcast that you created with the book, you own that IP. So if somebody ever wanted to buy it or something, that is a possible way that you could, you know, profit off of it eventually. But I, either way, I think like, for instance, if your book ever became a TV show, they would have to like buy that. They would have to pay you for that intellectual property. Whereas if you had just written a script and sold it, you wouldn't own that IP. <laughs> you would just- That's so strange. It's really strange. It's really stupid. It's one of the reasons why like people like, um, I think that the creator of uh, Walking Dead had a comic book line. Like he had a comic book that The Walking Dead is based off of. And so he owns the IP of The Whoa. Walking Dead. And like, of course, um, oh my God, Star Wars guy. <laughs> George Lucas? George Lucas. Basically, he's like the last person that the industry allowed to have to own their IP because that's what he wanted. He wanted to be able to own Star Wars. So, of course, he's made billions of dollars. I think at the time that he sold it, people were like, this is not going to make that much money or whatever. And they let him own it. And like he's made billions of dollars from all of the things that Star Wars has gone on to do. And like now the industry really does not let you own it. I think even podcasts were a way to own IP, but even that is being encroached on by these bigger companies. Like even they want to own the things that artists make. So I think what you've done is a fantastic investment in your future. Like writing a book means that you own your IP it means that you created a revenue source for yourself that's ongoing in perpetuity forever and you own it and you don't have to share it with anybody like a publisher or anything. And it's up to you, you know, like if you continue to write it or if you continue to promote it. So big ups to you, Joe Firestone. Okay, <laughs> like- I'll take it. Sure, I'll take it. <laughs> 
I, I think it's a huge accomplishment. I would love to write a book. I'm personally like, I don't know, like maybe I have to sign up for a class. I'm quite lazy when it comes to writing, which is hilarious since I have a podcast called The Working Writer and I'm also a writer. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of writers are really lazy. That's No, just, that, that I think that's, an, that's a very, very yeah. common trait. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know anyone that's a writer that's not like, that wants to write. Right. And they obviously want to work, <laughs> but it's so much mental energy. So much mental energy. Yeah, the IP, sure. I'm I'm all for IP. I will say that it is like I think that um uh I think that one thing about writing a book that maybe this will entice you as well is that you don't at least self publishing, you don't get any notes. Right? right. When you write a script, <laughs> there are so many notes. So, so many, many people notes. are like, do this, don't do this, the character is um the vibes are, you're like, what? Yeah. I don't even know what you're talking about. And you get yeah. so lost in it. And the a book, you're just like, the character should go drink juice. And no one's like, why does she drink juice? <laughs> and it's like, she just drank juice. Bye. You know, you're just like, that is so, feels so good. Yeah. It feels so good to not have notes. And if you only show it to friends. Yeah. It's the, the yeah. reason why I, I, I wanted to like... It's why this podcast exists, because I just wanted to make something that's just my notes, yeah. just my thoughts, nobody else's thoughts. I don't want anybody's opinion <laughs> at all. Yeah. Sure. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, and then you, you know, then, uh, then you start releasing it to the public. Sure. Then there's all that. But <laughs> I do think that the creation process with no one being like, eh, could the character have an arc this way? You're right. like. That stuff, I never, I can, I never will understand that stuff. Yeah. Someone has to be like, on page 12, make the character say, I love you. You're like, oh, okay, gotcha. All right. Like, but yeah. I feel like this is, it's a really nice thing to be, just go with your own ideas and just trust yourself. I love that. That's a great way to wrap things up. Might not be the right thing to do, but people will tell you that if you're wrong, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joe Firestone, for coming to the podcast. Appreciate you. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Joe Firestone. Make sure to check out her debut novel, Murder on Sex Island, and check her out in New York City. She performs regularly around town. That's all I've got for now. Until next time, get out there, get to work. There's no way I could do this podcast alone. I wanted to give a big shout out and thank you to our editor, Justin Asher, and to our other production assistants, Jemima Lariston, Maya Ricole, and Nicole Edwards. Thank you.